Well, hello, church family. Uh, we've been apart now 12 Sundays, and next Sunday will be the 13th Sunday we've been apart. But the good news is we're getting back together. So, on Father's Day, June 21st, we'll be able to be here in the service at the church worshiping. Now, things will be a little bit different when we come back together, but boy, I'm excited. So here are some things that are different. Uh, in order for all of us to come, we're gonna have three services. We can only have 50 people at each of these services. So we'll have one at 8.30, and then 10, and then 11.30. The service will be shorter, about an hour long, one of the other differences the elders have met, we've prayed through this, is we want to keep you safe. So just know the building will be thoroughly cleaned in between each service, and we'll have hand sanitizer available. We won't have any child care, so your children will sit with you. And because of that, I'm going to talk a little bit less, and I'm going to talk to your kids as well. So that'll be different. So there'll be 50 people, and we'll set up a place where you can register to come. Joy will let you know about that so that we have room for everybody. We encourage you to continue to social distance, to wash your hands with soap and water. We'll have the antibacterial stuff here for you as well. Uh, people will need to wear a mask. Uh, I'll be wearing a mask to keep each other safe. And we encourage you to do that. We'll have masks here if you don't have one that we can hand out at the door. But boy, we are so looking forward to being back together um, to worship. Now, some of you will feel pressured to come because you have come to church every Sunday since you were born almost, and uh, maybe you're the one who should not come because you have underlying health issues. And I want you to know as your pastor, it doesn't make it more spiritual for you to come here. You maybe need to stay at home. We're gonna continue to put the messages online. Uh, we want you to stay safe and healthy as well. Uh, when you come, we do ask that you greet each other with enthusiasm because, you know, we love one another. But please, you know, the social distancing will help us all stay safe. So Father's Day, the 21st. I am looking forward to it. I can't wait to see many of you here. If you can't come, I still, I've been receiving lots of phone calls and emails from you and uh, talking to you about how you're doing at home. And you guys have done a great job of staying connected even though we've been apart. Praise God, we can meet together again on Father's Day. Hello, church family. It's good to be together again and opening up God's word. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you very much for your word, for revealing to us who you are and how dependable you are. Thank you for making promises to us. Thank you that you keep each and every one of your promises. Father, we often struggle in following you, we struggle with faith, we struggle knowing how to live for you, or sometimes if you're even dependable or if you're even there, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word to our heart directly right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we talked about Abraham and the importance of embracing the call of God. And today uh, the title is Embrace the Call with Faith. And so we're going to talk about the faith of Abraham, and there's a very well-known verse that occurs in our scripture today, Genesis 15, 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now that's a very famous verse, and later on Paul will talk about this verse in the letter to the Romans, chapter 4, the letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, and he will talk about the faith that Abraham had as being the righteousness that God counted to him. Not that Abraham was so amazing or wonderful or did everything right, but that he believed God. And Paul will talk about that in relation to our following Jesus, that it is our faith in what God has done through Jesus that brings righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ that we have through faith. It's not that we work as hard as we can in order to please God or to earn righteousness, but we receive the salvation that comes through putting our faith in Christ. And this verse right here in Genesis 15 is very famous. Now let's look at this story. So um, there's a couple of things that are important about, uh, I want to point out that happen here, and that's that Abraham asks a lot of questions. And sometimes those questions seem like he is doubting God or questioning God. And I want to assure you of this, that God is very comfortable with you asking questions. And some of those questions that you might ask God might be pretty pointed. 
And the scripture tells us that God desires that. He desires for us to interact with him, to ask questions, to express our doubts. And when you do that, when you ask God questions, when you express your doubts, when you express your anger to God, you are speaking to the Lord as if he's a real person. And of course he is. But when you, when you talk about what's deepest in your heart to him, now you're speaking to him as a person. When you talk about God as a subject, like uh, uh, something to be spoken of, um, like an idea or a thought or some, something to be proved or to be reckoned with, um, and you keep yourself out of the discussion, or maybe uh, when we do that, we aren't talking with God as a person. And here I want you to notice how personable Abraham is when he speaks to God. So let's look at the first six verses of Genesis 15. And we're going to be looking at asking questions that lead to faith. And asking questions can lead to faith. So let's look at this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, the number of the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness." We can ask questions that lead to faith. Now, Abraham has been given a, a promise. He's been called in chapter, th chapter 12. Uh, he's been told by God to leave his home and to go to this new land. And he's been promised land, and he's been promised descendants, and he has been promised that the whole world will be blessed through his family. And here is Abram questioning God. He doesn't see that this is going to happen. He doesn't have a child yet. And so he rest, he's wrestling with God about God's promise. Now, something to notice here is that God speaks first. And this is something that is very true. We respond to God because he first calls us. Jesus talked about how we love him because he first loved us. God speaks first. And he says here, fear not. Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. So God tells Abram that he's going to protect him and he is going to provide or bless for him, bless him. And Abram says to God, I appreciate the protection and I appreciate the reward. What I really want is a kid. And that is crucial to the promise you've given me, God. What's up with that? And so Abraham begins to ask these questions. I don't have a child yet that my heir supposedly might be Eliezer, who helped, you know, at this battle that happened in Damascus. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And God says, no, when I say that the world is going to be blessed through your descendants, I mean your descendants from your body. You're going to have a son, your own son, who will be your heir. And then the Lord takes Abram outside and shows him all the stars in the heavens and says, look at these stars. Your descendants will be like that, numerous. Now, this promise that God gives, it doesn't prove anything, does it? Abram says he wants a child. God says, let's go look at the stars. What does that have to do with Abram having a child? Well, here's what it has to do with. God is the one who is showing him the stars. God is also the star maker. And the star maker is telling Abram, if I can make a star... And if I can make all those stars, I can give you a child. I can come through on my promise to you. And it says here that Abram believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Even with all of his questions and all of his doubts and all of his worries, Abram put his faith in what God had promised and this put him right with God. Now we come to faith often with many questions, many doubts, many hurts, things that we're angry about, things we don't understand, but we put our faith in Jesus. And when we do that, his righteousness is our righteousness. And we don't have to work or earn our salvation. We don't have to be perfect in order to be approved by God. It's our faith in Christ 
that brings righteousness, right relationship with God. So asking questions can lead us to faith. God is not bothered when we ask questions, when we try to work out how his promise is going to show up in our life, when we express our doubts, he answers our questions. But he doesn't answer every question, does he? No, but he gives us enough of a calling and he gives us enough of a promise for us to respond in faith. And this it leads us to the next uh, thing we're going to look at. This chapter started with, after these things. Well, obviously, a lot of stuff has happened before this chapter, and we're going to go back and look at those. But I wanted to look here first in chapter 15 at Abram's faith in the promise that God has given before we go back to the previous chapter. So these are some of the things that have happened. Back in chapter 12, Abram was pr promised land, one of the promises in chapter 12. But in verse 10 of chapter 12, there was a problem, and that was the famine. So there's a famine in this land in which he's promised. So he and Sarah went down to Egypt with everybody with them. And we've gone through that story. Uh, Abram lied. God sent plagues on the Pharaoh there. Um, they, they made it out of Egypt. Everybody was okay. Uh, but Abram had doubted the promise, and he had gone through fear. Uh, and this was based on the fact that God had promised land, but there was a famine in the land. Now, the next thing we see is in chapter 13. Uh, there's not just famine in the land. Now there's family strife. And so in chapter 13, uh, Lot, Abram's nephew, is with him. And there isn't enough space in the land in chapter 13 for their, their cattle and sheep to graze. Their workers are not getting along. It's too, it's too crowded. Now you might wonder, well, how could, the, how could the, the, this land not have enough space for these two guys and, and their stuff? Well, here's the thing. In chapter 13, it points out, and the Canaanites were living in the land. That's why. This land that Abram was promised, there were already people living there. So when Abram and Lot are moving their herds around, there are already people in towns and villages, and they already have sheep, and they have cattle, and so the space is cramped, and it leads to separation. And you might remember, uh, when the strife came up, Abram said, let there be no strife between us, which is a great statement. You might remember that Jesus in Matthew 5 said, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the sons of God. And here is Abram saying, let there be no strife between us. We're family. And so what does he let Lot do? He lets Lot choose whether to go to the left or the right. And so that's what Lot does. He chooses and he goes down towards the Jordan Valley, which is close to Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's the direction that Lot goes. And Abram continues um, east of there, I mean west of there in the Promised Land. So in chapter 13, land was promised, but there's strife in the family because it's cramped, and there's already people in the land that's promised. And this is the thing about having faith in what God has called you to do. Sometimes we have this strange idea that if God speaks and he gives us a calling and a promise, everything will be smooth, everything will work out, everything will be provided in the sense of there will be an abundance of everything. Pay attention to the life of, of Abram. God said, go, he went. He went to the land he was promised. What did he find? There was already people living there. He's in the land, things are going great. Then there's a famine in the land that he's promised. So he goes to Egypt. He gets a little nervous. He gets afraid. He gets fearful. He lies. His lie does not work out well. And yet it does because God's hand is with Abram. And so they move back up into the land of Canaan. And now there's family strife. And there's a separation between family members. All of this is while the promise is still valid and it's working itself out in faith, chapter 13. So, in chapter 13 also, God tells Abram, look at the dust, and there's a lot of dust in the land of Canaan. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust. So he reassures Abram the promise is still good. Now we come to chapter 14. There's a famine, there's family strife because of the cramped quarters, and now in chapter 14, there's war in this land. And so we have, uh, you know, in The Hobbit, there's a battle of five armies. Here we have like a battle of nine armies. So you have all these kings of all these towns, and they start fighting one another. 
And Lot gets swept up into this because one of the kings in the fight is from Sodom, and that's where Lot lives. And so Lot becomes a prisoner of war uh, in chapter 14. And Abram steps out in faith. He has 318 guys with him, and he steps out in faith and goes after and pursues uh, the enemy who has Lot and Lot's family and the other people and the goods. Uh, he goes and he defeats them and rescues them. He rescues Lot. And here in chapter 14, when they're coming back from battle, they meet somebody named Melchizedek in chapter 14. So in chapter 14, verse 17, after his return from the defeat of Kedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal or a strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anir, Eshol, and Mamre take their share. And so God has blessed uh, Abram by helping him defeat a superior force with his 318 guys. They've rescued everybody. And he meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek is um, a king and a priest of Salem, Jerusalem. Uh, Salem means peace, and he's the king and the priest of this city. And he comes out and meets Abram and gives him a blessing in the name of God Most High. That's El Elyon, God Most High. And when he does that, Abram gives him a tenth of what he has. And what we see here is Abram acknowledging that this victory comes from the hand of God. Only God could have brought about this victory. And an important part of acknowledging that is his tithe, his acknowledgement that all he has is from God, and so he tithes and gives to this priest. This is the first priest that we meet in the Bible, by the way, Melchizedek. Now, the name Melchizedek means God is my righteousness. And of course, in, in chapter 15, we will learn that righteousness is through faith. And so here is the king of you know, righteousness who comes and he blesses Abram. Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. The creator of all the world is, is called upon to bless Abram. And then Melchizedek says, blessed be God most high. So there's a thankfulness towards God who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now in chapter 15, at the beginning, God said to Abram, after these things, after these things, he said, I am your shield, don't be afraid. Well, what is God referring to after these things? Do not be afraid, I am your shield. He's referring to this, where God brought victory to Abram and rescued him and delivered him and all of these people and God tells Abram, I am with you. I am your shield. Do not be afraid. Now, Melchizedek, his name comes up in the, in the New Testament. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, except we should talk about it because it refers to Jesus. Now, Melchizedek is a king and a priest. Now, in Israel, when they have kings later on in their history, the king has political power. But the priest is a separate person. You do not, the, the priest and the king have separate jobs. That's made very clear. Uh, there are priests in the tribe of Levi, and there are kings in the tribe of Judah, and they don't share the same job. But here, this man is a king and a priest. And there was an understanding that when the Messiah came, he would be a king and a priest a priest on his throne. You can read about this in Psalm 110. This is a Psalm of David. David actually is the first Israelite to sit on the throne of Melchizedek in Jerusalem, where Melchizedek was king. David will sit on that throne, first Israelite to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And there's a promise made 
that the Messiah would be both priest and king. And you can read about this in the book of Hebrews, which we won't go through together, but there's a couple of chapters about Melchizedek, and it talks about how Jesus is our king and our priest. He has given his own life in our place because he's also the offering. He's the priest, he's the offering, his blood pays for our sin, and he is the king. And that is the one that we follow. And so, what do we learn about this? Well, we learn that actually acknowledging God for who he is and what he has done for us through giving a tithe shows, it's an action that shows the gratefulness on the part of the one who's been delivered and saved. And that's what Abram does. And he refuses to take anything from the king of Sodom. And we're told earlier in the book that Sodom was known for being a wicked city, and Abram does not want to align himself with Sodom. And so this story is there, and the priest calls on the name of El Elyon, the Most High. We're surprised to find somebody who's worshiping God besides Abram. But here's a man who is worshiping the high God who is the creator. He's not Jewish. He's a Canaanite, and he is worshiping, and Abram acknowledges this. Now, you'll notice in the text that Melchizedek calls God, God Most High, El Elyon. Abram is the one who introduces the name of God, Yahweh, Lord in all caps. And Abram says, um, the Lord, God Most High, Yahweh El Elyon, because Abram has this relationship with God that is pretty unique. And it comes out in the end of this story. And so here we come to the end of talking about how asking questions can lead to faith. It can. But in talking about Abram having a relationship with God, we're, that's what we're going to talk about next. Asking questions that lead to relationship with God. So we need to embrace the call with faith. And asking questions is a part of that. And here are some questions that can lead to a deeper relationship with God. So we're back in chapter 15 again, verse 7. And I'm going to read this uh, passage for us. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid them each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, it was dark, and behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, The Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Canaanites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so here, um, Abraham asks some more questions. How can I know that this land will be mine? Um, He is still unsure about this promise from God, even though he has faith. And even though that faith is at a level where God has counted it to him as righteousness, he's not done questioning God. And you shouldn't be either. You should have questions that you ask God about, and this should happen as things change in your life. When you stop asking God any questions, that's a sign, really, that you have lost interest in God and that you're living your life in your own power. You should always be open to asking God questions based on what's going on in your heart. God wants you to do that. And here's Abram doing that. So God calls first, verse 7. He said this, a very important phrase. 
I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Now that phrase might sound a little familiar, and it should, because this is how the Ten Commandments begin. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. That's almost an exact quote. It's just a different geographical spot. God is telling Abram, I am the Lord God who brought you up out of where you were born and brought you to this place. Just like he will tell the Israelites later on through Moses after the Exodus, I am the Lord God who brought you up out of Egypt. And this is important to remember in looking at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments actually begin with a relationship with God saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. I saved you. And therefore, Ten Commandments. And here, God is telling Abram, you and I have a relationship. I am the God that brought you from where you were to here, to this spot today, and I am with you, and I have given you promises, and I'm going to come through on those promises, and we have a relationship. And this comes um, about because of what's going on in Abram's life, this promise. Abram says, how, O Lord God, am I to know that I shall possess this land? Now, that might bother you, actually. God says, this is going to happen. And Abram says, I'm not so sure about that. But this is what we have to pay attention to, is that it's okay to ask these questions. I, I know it sounds like I've said that a lot, but I, I've been around people who have been in church a long time, and sometimes they are terrified to ask God anything or to tell God that they're angry at Him or any of that kind of stuff, and their relationship with God just suffers. It doesn't grow. It doesn't go anywhere. It, it, it dies sometimes because they don't feel they can talk to God about any of this stuff. And so, um, Abram asks his questions. Now notice, there is a committed response on Abram's part. Now this doesn't have to do with, uh, and we talk about this a lot as Christians, don't we? We don't earn our salvation, but I want you to notice that Abram has a committed response. What does he do? Well, he cuts some animals in half. So, this is in preparation for this covenant agreement that God is going to make with him. So some animals are cut in half. So Abram is expressing commitment to what God has in mind for him. And I think that's an important challenge to each of us. Can you point to something where you would say, this is a time where I stepped out in faith and did something that illustrated my commitment to wanting to know what God was doing in my life and wanting to embrace the call of God with faith? Or maybe that's what you're considering right now as you watch this message, that God's Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. You might not even know what He's speaking to you about, but right at this moment, you know that the Holy Spirit is reaching into your heart and saying, listen, and you're you're realizing that God is speaking to you at this moment, and you will be called upon to have some sort of active commitment in this relationship with God. God does all the heavy lifting, but notice that Abraham does something to show his commitment. So these animals are cut in half. Verse 12 says, As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell on him. And then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now when I read that, you might have not known what that was talking about. But what God is telling Abram is his descendants later on, they will end up in a foreign land, Egypt. And they will become slaves there in Egypt for 400 years. And he's he's letting Abram have a glimpse of the future. Now you or I, we may not want to have that kind of glimpse of the future, right? (laughs) You might not want to know. But God gives it to Abram. And I think part of it is reassuring in this way. God is telling Abram that he has his future in his hands. God is sovereign over Abram's future, and the promise is good. God can see out 400 years. This is way beyond when Abram's even going to be alive and can do anything about anything. And God says, I know what will happen. It's not all going to be pretty. Your descendants will end up as slaves for a period of time and be afflicted, but they will come out of Egypt and they will come back to this place that you're at right now and they will claim the land that I have promised. And that's what Abram sees in his his vision, his dream. 
There's also a, a committed response on the part of God. And let's look at this. Verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. And so this torch and smoke go between the pieces of the animals. Normally, the two people would go through, and the idea would be, well, if, if, if you don't keep your part of the deal, you're going to end up like these animals. And if I don't keep the deal, I'll end up like these animals, cut in half and dead. And that's the covenant. We agree that if we break this covenant, uh, this relationship, this friendship, this, um, this unity, if we break it, the person who breaks it will end up like these animals. Well, notice, Abram does not walk between the animals. Only God does. Smoke and fire. Remember later on in the story when the people of Israel are out of slavery and they're in the wilderness, how do they know where to go? Well, at night there's a pillar of fire and by day there's a pillar of cloud. And here, the cloud and the fire pass through the cut animals. And God says, this covenant will stand. If it doesn't, I'll end up just like these animals. Now that is pretty amazing. God makes this covenant and He makes it. And He knows all about our human tendencies to fail and be afraid and to not live up to our part of things. And He just says He'll do it. There is no greater demonstration of love than Jesus on the cross. God is so committed to you. Jesus laid His life down for you. That's the call. And right now, you may not have ever believed in Christ. You can feel the Holy Spirit calling to you. Jesus loved you first, and now He's calling you to love Him and put your faith in Him. And you don't have to figure everything out. You can rest assured that you can ask all the questions you want later on. It's not like question asking disappears. But the key is to put your faith in Christ and to be saved. This will not make you perfect in the sense of uh, never failing or never doubting. And we're going to move on in the story to see how this works in the story of Abraham. Uh, but I'm going to pause right now, and if, if you have been led by the Spirit to put your faith in Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If this is your desire to put your faith in Christ, please pray along with me. Father God, I know that you have created me, and I know that I, like other people, have done things wrong. I've sinned. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died on the cross in my place for my sins. I thank you that he rose from the dead on the third day. I put my faith in Jesus, and I ask that my sins are forgiven based on his blood, and I am thankful for new life based on his resurrection, and I ask for direction and power to live my life for you based on your presence and the Holy Spirit in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. It might bother you that it's that simple, but remember in our story that verse, in the middle of all these things that are happening and all the warfare and the famine and everything, it says, Abram believed God and he was credited righteousness, faith. Embrace the call with faith. Ask questions that lead to faith. Ask questions that lead to a deeper relationship. And now we're going to look at what happens when you ask no more questions, when you stop asking questions and you try to fix God's mistakes on your own? Okay, chapter 16. This is asking no more questions, fixing God's mistakes on your own. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egypt servant, Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. 
Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Now, there's a lot going on in this story. Obviously, this chapter could be its own message, but I really wanted to take the time to tie together this story with the story where Abram has faith. And this is why. We can respond in faith, and then at some point in our life, we can find that maybe our faith has evaporated. And we can stop asking God questions, so we stop hearing from God, and we can try to fix things on our own. What does Sarah do here? Well, you know, she has an attitude that God let her down. God has kept me from having a child. God let me down. He made this promise, and it hasn't happened. And then there's the, uh, the DIY, the do-it-yourself. You know, I have this, let's fix this problem. God didn't fix it, let's fix it. I have this maid, Hagar, and she encourages her husband to have a child by Hagar. Do it yourself. What does this cause? Conflict. No surprise there, right? Right, ladies? There's absolutely no surprise here that there's, there's conflict. Uh, by the way, I, I want to say that, uh, especially at this time, it was not regarded as a strange thing to have a, a surrogate child. So if you were unable to have children uh, and you could ask a woman to have a child who was then given to you and it was your child, this was not unusual. There's surrogate parenting that goes on in a a different way today, and, and so that was common here as well. The problem was not the surrogacy. The problem was that God had promised Abram and Sarah a child, and they doubted God's promise. That's the problem. And so... There's conflict and there's anger. Sarah is angry and she blames her husband. And it should make you laugh a little bit there, right? That Abram simply did what her idea was all about and and she blames him for that. And uh, there is, you know, we're talking about embracing the call with faith. And here it talks about Abram embracing Hagar. So, um, you know, you can make some connections there about what happens when our faith falls apart and what we end up embracing. But it goes even beyond anger, and Sarah begins to abuse Hagar. And so she flees. Now, I want to point out something interesting right here, and, and that is this. This story right here is the story of Israel in Egypt and the Exodus in miniature. We saw that when Abram and Sarah went down to Egypt and God ended up putting plagues on the Pharaoh because Sarah was with him, even though she was married to Abram. And we saw some connections to the Exodus in that story. There are connections here as well, only they're they're pretty interesting because who are Abram and Sarah in this story? They are the slave owners. Who is the slave? The Egyptian. These things are reversed. Abram and Sarah are in some ways the Pharaoh in this story. And Hagar in this story is like God's chosen people. She's the slave. And when it says that Sarah treated her harshly, that is exactly the same word that comes up in Exodus when it says that Pharaoh treated the Egyptian slaves harshly harshly. It's the same word. And when it says that Hagar flees, that is the same word that talks about Israel leaving Egypt. This is the story of the Exodus in miniature, only the roles are reversed. Father Abraham, the fountainhead of, you know, all Jews, and and Mother Sarah, they are Egypt in this story. And Hagar, who's the Egyptian, she is God's people in this story. And that says things to us about some of these things that uh, are going on in our country right now. Um, When we view people uh, racially one way or the other, and um, things shake out a certain way, depending on who's in power and who's not in power, this story does speak to that. Because in this situation, Abram and Sarah are the ones in power and Sarah is the one treating harshly, and Hagar is the innocent person fleeing. Later on, the people of Israel, they are not in power, the Egyptians are in power, and the Israelites are the ones treated harshly. And these things, in different situations, in different countries, and in different uh, people's lives, can be true. Now, I'm going to pause here and just read something on this issue. So, we have a lot of things going on in our country right now, and uh, Today is Flag Day, and I love our flag. So, you know, one of my most, the deepest moments for me 
concerning the flag is my father's funeral. My dad was in the Air Force, retired as a master sergeant, uh, received a bronze star. And um, at his funeral, there was military honors who drove over from uh, the air base. And the American flag is draped on his casket. And then it is taken up by his fellow airmen and folded and handed to my mom. Taps is played. That is the most moving moment I have in my life connected to our flag. And I thought I would share that on Flag Day. And then the story came up that's about the Air Force. So the new chief of Air Force is an African-American named uh, C.Q. Brown. And he made some statements connected with what's going on in our country now. And I put all this together in my mind because it's Flag Day. And I thought about my father's um, funeral and the flag on his casket. And he served in the Air Force. And the new chief of Air Force is this man. And this is what he says. As the commander of Pacific Air Forces, a senior leader in our Air Force and an African-American, many of you may be wondering what I'm thinking about the current events surrounding the tragic death of George Floyd. I'm thinking about how full I am with emotion, not just for George Floyd, but the many African Americans that have suffered the same fate as George Floyd. I'm thinking about the African Americans who went before me to make this opportunity possible. I'm thinking about the immense expectations that come with this historic nomination. He's the first uh, African American four-star general in charge of the Air Force. I can't fix centuries of racism in our country, nor can I fix decades of discrimination that may have impacted members of our Air Force. And this is the part I, I find very encouraging. I am thinking about how I can make improvements. And this spoke to my heart, and I appreciate his words. He can't go back and fix things that have already happened. But his area of responsibility is the Air Force, and that's what he speaks to. He has an opportunity to impact what is in front of him, his responsibility. And his thinking on this is how can he make it better? And that's an encouraging word for each of us. We're all in different places. We have different upbringings, different backgrounds, different families. We have different jobs. We have different neighbors, different friends. And in those friendships and family relationships and places where we work and schools that we go to, we have our sphere of influence. And we cannot go back and change everything that happened in the past. But because we have put our faith in Christ and our sins are forgiven because of what God did and because the Holy Spirit lives in our heart and we want to honor Christ with our actions and our words, what we can do is try to make things better. And so I found his words encouraging. And how is that connected to this story? Well, notice how carefully the writer of Genesis makes sure that we notice that this issue of who's in power and this racial difference and who's mistreating who and who has to run away and find God's help is reversed. And Abraham and Sarah are actually the bad guys in this story. So we're going to finish this story. So if you're following points, this is the fourth point, surprised by faith. So asking questions to, um, that lead to faith, asking questions that lead to a deeper relationship with God, asking no more questions, trying to fix God's mistakes. And this is the last point, surprised by faith. So starting with verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by the spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing for my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against his kinsmen. And so in the middle of the wilderness, where Hagar is about to give up, God comes and delivers a message of hope. And his hope, his hopeful message is that he hears. He tells her to name her child Ishmael, which means God hears. And 
he's telling her, I have listened to your cries while you were being mistreated. I heard them and I came to you. Well, that's what will happen to the people of God in Egypt. Their cry will go up to God and he hears their cry and he comes to them and helps. Now, if you read through this story again, notice this. Abram and Sarah kept talking about Hagar as the slave woman, the Egyptian, her, the slave woman, the Egyptian. The first person who uses her name is the angel of the Lord, Hagar. That says something. And she is fleeing from, from Sarah because of the mistreatment. And here's the really hard thing. What does God tell her to do? To return and to place herself in submission under Sarah and the affliction. This should bother you. Why does God do this? Well, part of the reason, remember, what did God tell Abram in chapter 12? Abram said to, or was told by God that he would be given the land and given offspring and that those who bless him would be blessed and those who curse him would be cursed and that through him the entire world would be blessed. And God tells Hagar, go back to where I am blessing people. And that is Abram right now. Go back there because you will find blessing. You also will have multitudes of descendants through Ishmael, God hears, your son. And so here we come to the end of the story. Verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Be'er Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Hagar gives God a name. You are the God who sees. This is actually the first time in Scripture where an angel comes to somebody, and it's to Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And she says, you are the God who sees. You are the one who cares about me. You are the one who knows what's going on in my life. And uh, you're not only the one who hears my cry, but you're the one who sees into my very heart, into my situation. What a beautiful name. And so she names the well. Bier is well. Laharoi, the God who sees. Leroy is actually the English name that comes from the Hebrew, Leroy, that talks about the one who sees. That's where that name comes from. And so she is given a promise. And notice, who does God come to? To Hagar. Who has forgotten to talk to God or ask God questions or seek God's guidance? Abram and Sarah. And this is why we pushed on into this chapter. Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But sometimes our faith in Christ looks like this. It's a mess. And they have created a mess, Abram and Sarah. They have. They've created a, a family conflict situation. It's going to end up in a broken family later on. It's, it's going to lead to a lot of difficulties, but God is going to be with them in it. But the people pursuing God is not the people you would think. It's not Abram and Sarah. It's Hagar. And she's surprised by it. And here's the thing. Jesus said, we love him because God first loved us. God calls. When he calls, the proper response is to embrace that call in faith, like Hagar did. What kind of commitment did she show that she was responding to God's leading? She went back. I would say that's even harder than cutting up a few animals. She went back to that situation and put herself there because God said that was how he would bless her. That is quite remarkable that this young woman does that. And she does. She goes back for quite a long time. For the next 13 years, she will live with them. And we'll find out what happens more in the story later. Here's the last thing I want to share. This chapter began with Sarah's scheme to get a child for herself that she could call her own, right? Well, notice how the verse ends. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram, whose name is missing from the last verse. Sarah. She is completely missing from the picture here. This is Hagar's child and Abram's child. And Sarah is left out, even though she tried to find a way to fix God's mistakes. Um, something else to notice here is that... Um, 
Hagar becomes significant. At the beginning of the story, she's insignificant. The Egyptian, the slave woman, and now she is very significant, and it's because she's embraced the call of God and done the hard thing and listened and obeyed. That's the story before us. It's a sweeping story with a lot of things to teach us, and I hope you go back and read through these things and ask yourself, what calling is God giving me? to respond in faith to and ask God questions so that you can find that your faith is revived, your relationship with God is deepened. Don't stop asking questions. Don't try to fix God's mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. He keeps all of his promises, even though it may seem slow that he keeps his promises. He keeps them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for the time we have had in your word. Uh, There's a lot here for us to think about, and I just trust that your Spirit will speak to us about what you want each of us individually to respond to. We're all different individuals. We have different struggles. We pray, Father, that you would speak to our heart. We know that you hear our cry. We know that you see what's going on in our lives. We pray for that moment of faith to come where we can respond to the love that you have for us. We do pray for our nation right now, which is going through many, many things, Um, a a pandemic and racial tensions. We pray, Father, for those of us in our congregation and those listening online. Help us to focus on what we're responsible for, the people in our lives in front of us, and to make things better in your power and leading. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I encourage you to be safe and to stay connected. And I'm looking forward to seeing you here at the church live pretty soon.